Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to see you all here. One of the pleasures of these conversations with distinguished alums is to see all the different parts of the English department come together, uh, faculty, graduate students, undergraduates, uh, alums. Um, so welcome to everyone. I'm uh, Samuel Otter, the current chair of the English department and a specialist in 19th century American literature. And it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome back to Berkeley David Corvo. He's been back to Berkeley many times, uh, but it's a particular pleasure to welcome back to the English department where he received his BA in 1972 um, and to the Maud Fife Room. Uh, uh, David was also an editor of the Daily Cal during his time here. Um, he's currently executive producer of the NBC primetime news magazine Dateline. Uh, a position he's held since 2001. And as he said to us in a conversation earlier today, that's the longest position he's ever held. Uh, he joined NBC News in 1995 uh, with a wide range of management duties at NBC, MSNBC, and CNBC. He began his broadcast journalism career in 1975 as a news writer and producer at what was then KNXT, what's now KCBS in Los Angeles. From 1982 to 1983, he was the assistant bureau manager for CBS News in Los Angeles. He then served as an executive producer for several um, national CBS News shows. He created CBS This Morning, served as its executive producer from 1987 to 1989. As vice president of public affairs programming from 1990 to 1992, he supervised uh, several of the network's primetime news magazine programs, including 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, and Street Stories. In November 1992, he joined Fox News Productions as vice president and executive producer. There, he also developed and produced news programs and introduced the news magazine Front Page. Um, as you can see, David Corvo has had a wide range of experience um, in news at major networks, Fox, CBS, um, NBC, most recently. And today, we'll talk with David Corvo about his trajectory from Berkeley to New York and NBC News, his pivotal role in producing television news magazines, and also his experience as a student on campus in the late 1960s and early 1970s and in the English department. I'm joined today by my colleague, Namali Serpel, who's a specialist in 20th century literatures with a particular interest in literature and ethics and in theories of reading. And she's currently working on a book about literary uncertainty. We'll talk for about 40 minutes and then take questions from the audience. And we'll take questions through the vehicle of the cards that have been passed out to you. About 10 minutes before we stop talking, I'll ask you to pass the cards to the aisle um, and we'll collect them and ask questions from those. After the conversation, you're all um, cordially invited to a reception um, straight down the hall. I'd like to begin with a question about how you got from here to there. That is, how you got from being a Berkeley English major to an executive producer at NBC News. And I'd like to ask this question in two registers. Practically, that is literally what steps you took, what decisions you make um, that led from here to there. And also in terms of values, what, what about being an English major you took with you, you've kept with you during your career? Sure. Um, thanks, thanks everybody for coming, filling up the room here. Um, uh, and thanks for the hospitality of the English department. I really appreciate it. I'm not sure what the English department's definition of the word distinguished is. I think you probably had to stretch it a little bit to get me here. <laughs> but didn't, I'm, didn't I'm I happy. just describe it? Yeah, I don't know. I think, I think what you did is go through a long list that made me feel really old. <laughs> about, I mean, how all these jobs. I'm glad you used the word. Does the word trajectory just mean still going up, or can a trajectory, is that mean like an arc? No. I, 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 you know. We mean ascension. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Actually, although I've had a lot of jobs, I've only had really one career. I mean, I've done really two things in my life, uh, bus boy and news guy. <laughs> and that's really pretty much it. Uh, I, I think one summer I was writing a documentary, and I did work in a factory because I thought it would be interesting to 
see what a miserable life that was like. Uh, but other than that, um, I've been in the television news business uh, my whole life. And in fact, I kind of grew up in it. And so the, the, it looks very logical what I ended up doing when I tell you about my past, but it wasn't. Um, and Berkeley was the place where I, I sort of changed direction. And I say it looks logical because my father was in television. And I grew up uh, hanging out in television stations. He was not a news guy, although when he was a young man in the 50s and television was a great time, you did uh, everything. You know, you, you, I mean, he was the lighting director, uh, uh, cameraman, uh, commercial salesman, sports guy, all at once, you know, that kind of thing, which, uh, which is, we, we may be getting back to for different reasons. Um, so I, I would, uh, literally, my brother and I would stow away in his car on Saturday mornings, because he would <coughs> work on Saturdays, too, and they would have live program. Everything was live in those days. And they had gigantic prop rooms, because all the commercials were live, so they had uh, gas stations and kitchens and and uh, car distributor ships all mocked up and all the props. So we'd spend the whole day, uh, he tried to get out of the house without us, but when he didn't make it, we would spend the whole day in the prop rooms creating you know, fantasy stories and stuff like that. And when I got a little older, I gravitated to the newsroom. I mean, he was always sort of the boss at the station, but I used to like to hang out uh, in the newsroom. I, I got one guy to let me hang out there because I used to babysit for his kids when I was in high school, so when there was an election night or something, he let me come to the newsroom, and I just thought it was cool. I really liked the camaraderie of the newsroom, and I liked the speed at which things worked. And as a consequence, uh, when I was in school, going back to grammar school, I always worked on the school newspaper, and just because I kind of had a knack for it, really just for fun. And when I got to Berkeley, I, went to, I, I came to Berkeley specifically for the English department. Um, uh, I knew it was the best. I, my intention was to be a professor of English uh, before somebody uh, slapped that idea out of me. <laughs> but, but that was my intention. I, I was, it was completely sort of intellectually driven. Um, I loved to read. Uh, I, I moved from Connecticut to Sacramento when I was in high school. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you that story. I'll get a little bit of a uh, um, cold, uh, diversion here, but it, it, has, it has a point to it. My father, we were, we were in Connecticut. We grew up in Connecticut. My father was running a TV station there and had kind of sort of topped out, was kind of bored, and decided he would look for a job somewhere else. And he and I, rem I remember, watched a documentary on CBS about the California education, higher education system, right? Uh, community schools, state colleges, universities. And, and uh, he saw that, and he had, at that point, seven children good Italian-Irish family, and he said, wait a minute, I don't know how I'm going to afford to put seven kids through Yale, but look at this, I'm getting a job in California. And he specifically <laughs> got a job here because of the education system, which is now under such peril, in such peril. So he, um, we moved to Sacramento, which I absolutely deplored. Uh, I hated the high school, you know, I sort of hated everything about it, but um, um, I, I used to, and I used to, there were, it was very hot there, really hot. And I don't think, I don't know if air conditioning was as widespread as it is now in 1967, 68. There were two places to go, the movies and the library. <laughs> this is true. So I used to go to one or the other. And of course my house, you know, we ended up having nine children in the family. One place you did not go was the house, you know. <laughs> and we had plenty of room, I guess, but I mean, yikes. So I spent a lot of time, sur I guess you'd call it surfing the web now. In those days it was, you know, wandering the shelves, grabbing, you know, oh, I heard of this, Whitman, let me try that. You know, uh, uh, William Carlos Williams, I think I heard something about him. And literally pulling books off the shelves and, and then, you know, sitting down and spending hours reading them. So I was all primed to come, and I loved it, of course, and primed to come here. Uh, to school, uh, and, but when I got here, I did what I always, I, I joined the newspaper. And the reason is, basically I wanted to get laid. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, want, 
I wanted to meet <laughs> girls. I wanted to meet people. You know, I wanted to find an affinity group. And I knew, you know, it's a big place, <laughs> scary place to some degree. And I thought, well, I'll, I know I can do the newspaper thing, and I'll meet some kids, get, make some friends, and so forth. This and this is exactly, again instead of the internet, right? This is way, <laughs> way ahead of the internet, exactly. <laughs> Would have been simpler. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the girl thing didn't work out terribly well. <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed the people in, in the newsroom. And I, I, I had already worked in television news, believe it or not, by then. So I really sort of knew that I could do it. And it turned out that I could do it very fast. So I started getting a lot of assignments. And pretty soon I got an editorship. And I really didn't intend to do it. And it kind of dovetailed with the era in a lot of ways. Um, the notion of, you know, of being engaged in society was just very strong here at Berkeley. And maybe I think it probably still is. And the idea of sort of sitting in a garret, you know, doing one more translation of Beowulf didn't seem like a, a real contribution to society at the time. I think in many ways it is. But at, when I'm 20 years old at that time, the pressure was, what are you going to do besides stand on the corner or stand in the street and, and complain about stuff. And the most subversive thing you could do is join a conservative institution. And we all thought that the mainstream news media was pretty conservative in a sense of uh, what it covered and how it covered it. And it was mainly white male at that time, both on air and off. So I thought, well, I, I can do that. I can join television stations and everything else, and maybe I can Maybe I'll like it. I'll do it for a while. I also didn't, was tired of student loans up to here and everything else, of course, all that stuff. And I ended up just staying in it. My intention was to come back to school, and I never, never did. Uh, and uh, the, the trajectory, as you so nicely put it, uh, through those jobs was I guess I just couldn't hold one. I kept, you know, <laughs> kept changing. But it just, I just, it was a very mundane. Uh, uh, sort of protocol. I just moved one job up to the next and getting sort of more and more responsibility. responsibility, And, you know, being sort of get, given a lot of opportunities. And that's partly where the Daily Cal experience helped me a lot, because I had been a kind of a boss, so to speak, at an early, at an early age. And um, I was able to take on more and more responsibility. And so and it's a practical matter. Uh, um, I learned just really how to work with groups and all that sort of stuff, and uh, kept going from one job to another. And as I said, this was the longest one I've ever. I've always had a job, <laughs> but this assignment, as I call it, is take is like been eight years, and that's long for me. I usually get restless and move on to something else. Uh, this one is a lot of fun, uh, and the business is going through a lot of change, and it's just kind of funny circumstances. And that's why, as you get older, you know. The young guys, the young people, because they're mostly women, actually, are taking all the, the, the daily. I mean, daily journalism is really, that's for young people. I mean, that's blasting out of the house and running over to Europe and running here and there. That's that stuff. I mean, your legs go before you, <laughs> you know. So, so then you stay. You end up being a more of a supervisor and that sort of thing. And that's what I do now. I think that um, the general, the, the sort of larger question you asked about a. Uh, an English department background um, has come into focus for me in this job most recently. I mean, first of all, I learned how to think and write critically. That, that's the most important thing. Secondly, I, I worked with, or was in class with really, really smart kids. And I actually had to do some work. I always was a good student, but I actually had to read the stuff and, and think about it <laughs> and, and was challenged. And I you know, learned the self-confidence that I could sort of hold my own, that I could actually read something that made absolutely no sense to me on Monday. And by Friday, uh, it seemed to have some meaning. Um, in that sense, it was very, impor very important. Also, I think that uh, journalism um, can often be just a recitation of the facts if it's done poorly. And it may be not even facts. It may be details numbers, sorts of things like that, that have no real context. But it, what it's really about is story. And I, think that it, it, and I think that I learned in some inherent way about storytelling um, here in the English department, because 
what, that's what we're doing is reading and studying both the part, the content of stories, but also the form. And uh, <clears throat> form is an extension of content, right? The correct form, merely the extension of the correct content. I remember that. Um, and I, now that I work on a show that does hour long and two hour long stories, well, we use the, the uh, conventions of fiction really to tell those stories. They're nonfiction. They have to be true. The facts have to be correct, of, of course. Um, but we use the whole principles of rising action and falling action, conflict and, and, uh, and resolution, beginning, middle, and end, all those sort of structural things that come from, you know, I think reading novels and, and, and reading in depth and trying to understand the structure of great storytelling. Um, uh, I, I, I said earlier to these guys that uh, when I took over Dateline, people used to say to me about hour-long stories, well, they're like mini movies, you know, very visual and all that. And I said, they're not. I came to understand they're literally like little novels. That's what they are because they have a very strong central voice, which is the voice, literally the voice of the correspondent who writes writes the stories, and all the other stuff, which is to say the, uh, the pictures, the visuals, and all that editing, that all needs, when the story works, it all comes out of that strong central voice. And I'm very much a believer in that, and that's the way my show, in some subtle ways, is different than other news magazines. Um, and, I, and I think all that goes back to the appreciation of, of story that I learned, learned here. You, you mentioned storytelling. I'd like to ask you a further question about that. <clears throat> As you suggested, something that distinguishes Dateline is the long form mm -hmm. of the stories that are yeah. told. But an interesting thing about Dateline, it seems to me, is that the stories are about storytelling, but they're also about some other things that English majors do. They're about research. Um, they're about argument. So I wonder if you talk a bit about one of the um, most uh, prominent stories told on Dateline, um, which we talked about a bit earlier, the shooting in Cincinnati. Right. Um, I gave this uh, to Sam as an, a, an, as an example of trying to use the narrative forms and combine it with investigative reporting. When you think of investigative reporting, you really think of just sort of digging in and getting the facts. But it is much more accessible right, if you can turn that into a story. So we were looking into, uh, a few years ago, there was a shooting in Cincinnati of a, a young uh, black man was shot, he was wanted, he had, he had uh, there were several warrants out for his arrest. He was shot, some, some riots happened after that. Well, it turned out the warrants were for traffic violations. And we started thinking, really? You really get shot for that? I mean, that doesn't sound right. And then it was a history of trouble between the police department and, and the, the black community in Cincinnati. So that's where we started. And what we discovered along the way, if I can jumpstart it, was that um, he, we started looking into the phenomenon, the so-called phenomenon of driving while black. You know, do you get stopped just because you're black? And we, tried, we started looking into the tickets you know, first tens of thousands of tra traffic violation tickets issued in the city. And it turned out that the tickets were about the same on a percentage basis. But then we looked one layer deeper, which is into tickets for non-moving violations, which I didn't even know what that was. But it's, when you think about it, just what it described. You, uh, you uh, a moving violation is you go through a red light. Right? A non-moving violation is you, your registration is out of date, you're not wearing your seat belt, you don't have your driver's license, okay? The percentage black versus white was hugely different. Okay, those are pretext stops. You're being stopped before anybody knows that you don't have your license with you, right? There was driving while black. And then we expanded that to every city we could get our hands on the records, which wasn't every one. I think we did about a dozen cities. We ended up spending two years and going through four million tickets and figuring out when we found one city where looked like they were handling it well in a lot of places that were not. But so, so now we have this pile of stuff here. But what we did was we went out with the Cincinnati police who actually cooperated with us. And we started, I said, how do we make a story out of this? Well, we made it the story of the reporter's journey. He started on the streets with a cop and had these very dramatic incidents where the cop was stopping people, some of whom seemed like they were pretty suspicious, to be honest. Others, it's hard to tell. 
and we lived with him. And then he went from there to the families of those people who were stopped, and then to the families of the guy who was killed, and then down to the, literally, the computer area. And then we went into the records, and pretty soon it was this reporter's journey, his discovery that this, that this sm a small incident, even though you know, it was a fatality, led to this huge systematic problem. And then at the end, we confronted a lot of police departments and said, why don't you do something about it? And it was a way of imposing, sort of, or finding a story within an investigative sort of thing. And I think it made it much easier for the viewers to stay with us. And that, that's where the sense of story can be extended. Is, is the sense of story ever a problem? Is it, it, which is to say, is there ever a tension between the use of language sort of instrumentally or transparently, the use of image to tell facts, to tell truths? Does it ever conflict with the desire to compel your viewer or to, to tell a story? I'm interested in whether transparency and, and rhetoric are ever in conflict in your job, or whether you see them as working together. Well, sure. I would say that some images are so powerful, they overwhelm whatever meaning you want to, want to give them sometimes. Mm. That's a, that's a real danger, um, and that can be positive or negative. I mean, the images of 9-11, mm. for instance, were so overwhelming that, that it was hard to say something constructive, so to speak, if you, uh, about it. Uh, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's simple. I mean, sometimes it's simple as, as uh, gosh, you're covering a crime story and you leave the more gory uh, shots out because, mm. you know, uh, the editors tend to put them in because they're like filmmakers, you know, and we tend to take them out because they're just totally distracting. Forget whether they're good taste or not. Mm. Sometimes they might have a point if somebody's, some, there's been some uh, brutality, particularly political brutality, you know, but other times those sorts of images can completely overwhelm what you're trying to say. Mm. So there is, there is sometimes you're weighing the those things. The sensationalism versus yeah, yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. power. Yeah. yeah, and, and, and that's, that's what we get paid to do, and to figure that out, and sometimes we don't get that right. There'll be a lot of times where somebody will call, I mean, it, people call and complain about stories constantly, of course, because <laughs> they bring their own sense of it, you know, particularly if it's a sensitive issue. Um, and they'll say, you never said such and such. And we'll say, well, yes, we did. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at the script right here. We, we said it. But the story sometimes can be so powerful, they miss it, because mm. people, so sort of half watch, half listen to television, you know, uh, a lot of times. So we're aware. We're aware. You don't go back. You, you can't go back like a newspaper or, excuse me, like the internet and read it over and over. <laughs> I was actually just about to ask um, how you see this differing from the, the work that you've done in writing and in, uh, in newsprint as opposed to... Well, I never wanted a long-time career in print. I sort of thought print was on the way out. I thought so, 1973. Uh, <laughs> so I was all, I guess I was right eventually. <laughs> but I liked, I liked the collaboration of television. Is that a print reporter, and I have, you know, met, I've seen many of my friends, including some people from the Daily Cal that I was with, or, or at the New York Times now and stuff. You know, they love the notebook, the pencil, right, and their own keyboard, and you know, and in fact the. You know, the single most important piece of technology in reporting is not the internet, you know, it's still the telephone. Pick up a telephone and find something out that nobody knows. That, that's really the, that's the most important thing. Um, but I like going out, the cruise, you go out, you got two, you know, two cameras and lighting and a reporter and editors and you're, you have a group trying to make something of this. I, I just always like that. I like the visual aspect of it. Um, I like the editing. I think it's fun to be in edit rooms. One of the reasons I left the front office and went back to producing, uh, I think I was probably a better executive than I am producer, but it's much more fun to be in an edit room than a, than a conference room talking about the budget, you know, <laughs> and arguing over shots, just as you mm -hmm. describe, should we put that in or take that out, and what's the impact of that on the audience? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's why I drifted into television. Tell us exactly what an executive producer at Dateline does. Gets all the credit and dishes out all the blame. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, it's essentially I'm the boss of the show. So I okay the stories, hire the staff, um, I screen all the stories before they air, 
and they have to sort of make, they sort of have to um, meet my okay before they, their broadcast. I schedule them. Uh, I fight with the network over my time period. I fight with the news division over my budget. Uh, I get to promote people. I get to lay people off. Uh, the whole, the whole, the whole thing, and I get to be part of the uh, management team that runs NBC News. Um, so uh, it's, it's you know, it's being the uh, last responsible person at the end of the road, I guess. Um, what are some of the factors sort of external to that um, organization that are really important for you as you sort of track a vision of what you want well, the station I guess, to do? Well, I guess this would be external, but the single most important thing is to have millions of people watching what we do. Right. That, that is absolutely, I mean, uh, some of my people say to me, I say, ask them, what, what do you do? And you say, well, I, 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 I make news stories. And I said, no, you don't. You make news stories that millions of people must watch. <laughs> and that's why you get paid a lot of money, relatively speaking. Because um, NBC, or the networks I've worked at, and they're big, you know, MSM, ma mainstream media. And they, re they require millions of viewers to sustain the big operations. That, that they're, they're like big battleships going down the Gulf, you know. They don't really turn very well, but when they fire the guns, they're pretty loud. And uh, we need, we need, it's our, it's, it's, if, if I don't get a big audience, I don't have it, I'm not on the air. So in terms of, I don't know if I would call that external, because it's, it's at the heart right. of what we do. Uh, and I tell people, look, if you want to, <clears throat> if you don't want to cover the sort of broad-based stories in a way that's, that, are, that is easily accessible to a lot of people, then, you know, there are a lot of other jobs you can, I mean, you can, you can go right from, like, my wife's involved in Nation Magazine, to some degree. I love that magazine. You can go there. You can go work for a lot of other places. Now, you're going to trade maybe uh, a salary for freedom. Or my wife, most of her life was a freelancer because she hated the management structure over mm -hmm. her. And she probably paid the price in terms of, you know, sort of a stable career. But that was a trade off she was absolutely willing to make. Um, and in, 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 in big network television, you have to have a big audience, which I like, because I like appealing to lots and lots of people. And so when I, if I didn't have a big audience every week, I wouldn't be able to, the story I described earlier with all the traffic tickets, well, that took us two plus years to work on. So if we didn't have the resources to do that, we couldn't do that story, it never would have been done. You know, so, and there are lots of stories like that every year that we do. What kind of tensions, if any, do you feel between the pressure for a large audience and the, either the kinds of stories you want to tell or the ways in which you want to tell them? That is, do you feel, do you feel that the pressures of convention are um, limiting or in some ways enabling? Or is it that in a news magazine you tell some kinds of stories so that you can tell other kinds of stories. Again, I'm wondering about mm. the relationship between what you said earlier, which is your interest in storytelling, um, and the pressures of an audience uh, on the ways and content of the stories. Yeah, um, there's sort of a general view, or a myth, I think, that if um, news people left to their own devices or, or what, if it wasn't for big bad corporate America or something, that they would all be doing stories, uh, you know, about Darfur every week or something like this, which is really, and they sort of hold their nose and do stories about Michael Jackson instead. I don't feel that way at all. I feel like we should do the Darfur stories and do the Michael Jackson stories and do, do it all. It, again, if I was running uh, a different kind of magazine and with a different audience, I would probably, if I was running the Daily Cal, I'd probably not do a lot on Michael Jackson. You know, I don't think the, the Daily Cal audience probably gives a crap about that. But you know, <laughs> my audience does. So, so I think that it's about having a relationship with your audience. It's about knowing your audience and respecting your audience. So that on one week, I, I do stories that I, I like and I think they'll like. And the next week, I might do a story that I'm not, they're not automatically going to hear and say, oh, yeah, I can't wait to see that. But because they trust my program, because week after week we're on the same page with them, they'll give it a try. 
and that's that's what a newspaper does. That's what a that's what a magazine does. It's it's a mixture. You know, I say to people, new, you know, sometimes you know, news is what people are interested in, but it's also what people would be interested in if they knew about it. You know, and you have an obligation to sort of tell tell both. I think, or we have a desire to tell both. I don't know that I almost everything that I do on a news magazine is discretionary. I mean, when in the sense that I don't have to do anything really. I mean, if there's a big news story, we kind of do specials. You know, um, um, uh, you know, 9/11 being the biggest example, but a big hurricane or something like that where the country's really interested. Okay, we have to step up and tell that story or the political you know, the, the presidential election. Okay, I think there's an obligation there. Most of the time, nah, if I want to do a murder mystery, I can do that. If I want to do an investigative report, I can do that. You know, my, my responsibility to my company is to make sure lots of people are watching. But they want something that they're proud of as well. You know, they don't want, you know, I don't know, there are stuff we could put on, I guess, that they wouldn't be proud of. But I, I think it's all a mixture of being a normal human being. And I think that that's part of actually <clears throat> Most people, I, I have a think that oh, you went to Berkeley, therefore you must kind of be a news snob. <laughs> you know, you must really want to do only uh, sort of high-end, you know, international stories and stories about the environment, and whatever, whatever you think are the, you know, complicated, difficult stories. I mean, they force you to do all these popular stories. But I took away from Berkeley just the opposite. I think the egalitarianism that's here, the appreciation of different cultures and people, the respect people have for each other as an individual helped me understand and respect my audience. I'm not any better than the people who want to, who enjoy the Michael Jackson story or are interested in him and he's been a part of their life. I mean, so, you know, don't, I learned very easily, something that Tom Brokaw told me too, you know, don't be above the news and it's really don't be above your audience. Again, if you want to select a different audience, you can do so. You can work in various places that have different kinds of audiences. And I like having the big, the big platform. Um, this is a slightly different question, but it has to do somewhat with the question of popularity and how popular a show might be. And again, going back to my earlier question about, about rhetoric. Um, you talked a little bit about two different ways to make facts or an, an investigation more appealing to an mm -hmm. audience. One way is to give it a story. The other way you talked about it is by putting it in, uh, in combination with mm -hmm. a story that you know people want to hear. Um, and I'm curious as to whether, what are some of, some of the other ways um, that you make uh, an audience come to your show? And in particular, I'm interested in how you view your appeal to young audiences um, in competition with or in contrast with or in comparison with uh, some of these um, comedy news shows like The John Stewart Show uh -huh. and The Colbert Report, which use a totally different rhetorical tack to appeal to their audiences. Yeah, um, well, I would say we don't appeal to young people. <laughs> <And, laughs> Do you I, not I, try I, to or? <laughs> well, you know, you can't, you can't sort of, you know, put a, put a cool, outfit on, like, on me, <laughs> and all of a sudden everybody young likes me. I mean, that's not going to work. Uh, um, I, in fact, recently I had to do a presentation to within the company, and we had, a, we had to talk about our competitors. So every show, the Today Show, put up information about Good Morning America, and the guy who runs Nightly News put up information about the Katie Couric program. I put up a picture of my kids. And I said, here's my competitors. My kids would rather have dinner with the devil than watch Dateline. <laughs> and in their case, the devil would be Dick Cheney. But, but um, uh, that's their view. But uh, I don't think you can fake it. I mean, I think particularly mm. with young people, I don't think, uh, what, what will happen, is, so I don't really, we're uh, the audience that m my company would like us to attract mm -hmm. are people sort of 18 to 49, they don't care about people my age, really. That's, that's the audience that advertisers want, okay? And they're the ones that pay our bills. They're really our customers, you know, they're really our clients. Um, uh, but I, you know, I only can tell stories that I think I can tell them that are interesting and that, have attra that are attractive in the broadest sense of that word. Um, when there's a Michael Jackson story, for instance, well, you know, sort of more young people might hear about it and come over because they're interested in music. 
um, but I, I, it's very difficult to uh, be so precise that you can get, you know, you can turn the show around and have, you know, sort of 18-year-olds watching it. Um, I don't really compete with Stewart and Colbert in the sense because they're covering daily news, they're, or they're, mm. they're not really covering it, they're right. <laughs> uncovering the stupidities and the coverage of daily news and from their point of view. And I do these sort of long form things. They make fun of my show constantly and so does Saturday Night Live, <laughs> which we, we think is a good thing if we're on Saturday Night Live. But, uh, and my, my kids like the satires of the show. What, what do they make fun of in particular? A couple of correspondents on the show. With, mm -hmm. Funny way of talking, and they used to make fun of Stone Phillips when he was on the show, being kind of stiff and old-fashioned. Uh, and that's 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 okay. I think those shows are competition for news. I mean, mm -hmm. news in general, not my particular program, but certainly for my my news organization. And it's funny because John Stewart keeps telling everybody, "Hey, everybody, this is fake." Right. But it's become a primary news source for a lot of <laughs> a lot of young people, um, and I think that we should learn some things from them. I, I'm very envious of the, ta the videotape editing that Stewart does, in which case, uh, for instance, he'll put up, he'll show how, he'll, you know, how speeches conflict with each other or are repeated, things like that. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really good editing, which really is just letting these things speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why a traditional newscast couldn't, couldn't do that. Mm. I mean, we're not going to have sketches. I'm not particularly, right. I don't think he's much of an interviewer, you know, that sort of thing. When he starts getting on a soapbox and telling everybody what news should or should not be, I think that, that puts people to sleep. Right. I think Colbert is a brilliant show and, and a harder show to do mm -hmm. than, than uh, Stewart because he's, he's in character. Stewart is doing his monologues, right, and responding to dopey stuff that he's seen on the news that he thinks is dopey. Colbert's creating a whole character every night and commenting on the news and character. That's incredibly difficult. Really great performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that would work. Those shows, those shows get, you know, a million people a night to watch them. You know, you can't survive on a broadcast network with that size audience. It's too mm -hmm. small. If we could figure out a way, I mean, look, Jay Leno is on five nights a week now and, a lot, you know, and he's trying to do not quite what they do, but he's trying to be very topical. And he may develop that program into a little bit more topical uh, program that maybe borrows some of, some of the sort of things they do in some way. Uh, now, Molly asked you about the cable comedy news shows, which yeah. makes me want to ask you about the internet. The, um, you spoke in August to the um, New students at their orientation at the School of Journalism, yeah. and I was uh, told them good luck. You, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, along with telling them good luck, you uh, talked. I, I thought you said a very interesting thing about Don Hewitt and Walter Cronkite and their response to television uh, in the early days and the new technology and their response. You argued wasn't the conventional response of the time of the news elite. Right. which was to treat television news, among the print elite, to treat television news as minor, as incidental, as mm. for the children, um, yeah. making fun of its unseriousness. Yeah. So your point was about um, Hewitt and Cronkite um, seeing the possibilities in the new technology. Right. Th those two gentlemen, uh, both of whom I worked with, uh, had died close, by, close to each other right around when I spoke to the, the J School kids. And um, they didn't even know who he was. They, they were, which is telling, interestingly, because they're the fathers of television news, um, <clears throat> literally. And they were early adapters, is what I told them. They both came out of World War II, and the broadcast news really came into its own in, during World War II with the Murrow boys, not to burden you with this whole history, but basically on radio, right? reporting the war on radio. That's what grew up broadcast news. And then television started to emerge right in the early 50s. And you know the radio guys looked down their nose at television. Nobody thought it was serious. Both these guys, um, uh, Don Hewitt, who of course ran 60 Minutes for a thousand years, didn't have a college degree and wasn't uh, quite uh, acceptable 
to, to the powers at CBS News, so they stuck him in television. And Walter had irritated uh, Murrow because he didn't become a Murrow boy during World War II. He was a wire service guy. And he kicked around a little bit. They, they worked very closely once they got CBS News. So he was, oh, he's kind of, he was a sports guy for a little bit in college and stick him over on television. It was kind of the, you know, the place where you went if you weren't uh, a, a kind of a serious journalist. But they both saw the possibilities of it and grew with it. And I, and I was telling the journal students, I think they have to ad adopt or uh, embrace the internet in the same way uh, instead of um, sort of running away from it that they have to learn all the skills involved in the internet. And some, some of them have their hearts set on being documentarians, or some of them even uh, you know, re reporters from the New York Times. I uh, said, so you just have to rethink that. You can, bring, you can learn the same things and have the same impact uh, as journalists. But you're going to have to, I think, you'd be wise to embrace and change and develop the new media. So both, I mean, Walter developed the whole idea of an anchor man didn't exist before Walter, really. He developed it. Don Hewitt invented most of the techniques that you would take for granted, including putting somebody's name underneath you when you're on TV. He figured out the way to do that. It sounds dopey, but nobody had done a lot of this stuff before. Nobody had run sound and a picture separately before. You know, all these things that are common grammar of television news, he invented. So they didn't just go to the, go to the uh, television side and surf the wave as it grew. They made the wave. You know, they built the boat. And I think that's what, what young journalists today should do. Because I think the internet right now, is, of course, is sort of wide open. And, they also better figure out how they get paid for it, but that's another <laughs> I was, story. I was going to ask you about that. Do you, do you yeah. have any sense of what it would mean to make the wave of the internet, of what the possibilities and risks are? Clearly, there's a significant risk to print journalism. But yeah. do you have any, given your, given your interest in, as you just spoke, in the transition from radio technology to television technology, um, do you have a sense of the possibilities of the internet? Well, you know, I think its ubiquity is, is part of its power. And I think its speed is part of its power. I think it's, uh, it's but again, it's, uh, you know, anybody can sort of figure out how to shoot, edit, and write a story, turn it into zeros and ones, send it up to some cloud somewhere, and have it rain down on everybody's screens. You know what? My 16-year-olds can figure that out. But he can't report and write. And that ultimately is what is going to make the internet as mature, I think, as television news or, or as print stories are. It's the content that really matters. And the form in which it's delivered can help shape the content. Because obviously, you know, television news stories are not the same as print stories. And they won't be the same on the internet, which combines both text and video. Um, and I don't know how that ultimately is going to shape up. But I don't believe so much in the concept of everybody at home wants to be an editor, because you know, which is one of the concepts that you sort of, you sort of are going to be able to pull raw video from here and text from here and kind of create your own news education every day, your own newscast, would it be? Which is one of the reigning theories for a while. I don't think anybody has time for that, <laughs> to be honest. I think you want to find places where you can go where you're getting the sustenance, the information that you need. And I think you want it told in ways that are memorable. And that's, what, that's the skills that people have to develop and then figure out how to, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it sounds like a uh, kind of a mundane thing, but you got to figure out how to monetize that. Because you can't do a two-year uh, two uh, investigative reporting job if people are, people are not, uh, you're not raising the resources to do it. And right now, the, the, these sites are most of these news sites, which rely mostly on stealing our stuff, which we let them, by the way. So <laughs> it's like, as I said, stealing. It's like we let them in the door and show them where the silverware is. But um, they're they're not making money. I mean, they're they're not making any money. And my guess is that, like everything else, some sort of larger corporate interest will probably move in and organize some of that if they can figure out how to make money. I mean, we make money on our site, MSNBC.com which started in 1996. 
and we make a lot of money on it, but it's a very organized, you know, sold through site, and CNN does, but most of these sites that you guys probably go to, you know, they're, they're, the correspondents or writers are working for free on many of them. They're using our material and so forth. As I say, we, I don't know, our commercials go along with it, so those things they're not paying for, there really is not an economic model yet that's going to, that works, I think. You've talked a little bit in, in both um, what you, your comments about the internet and in what you've had to say about um, TV journalism, about the importance of writing. Writing yeah. comes up a lot. And yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if we can bring it back to Cal and, and ask you um, about your writing here um, as a student, both extracurricularly and in, in classes, whether you remember any moments of creative writing or moments of journalistic writing that stand out for you. And well, uh, just before you answer that question, uh, this would be a good time to pass your question cards if you have questions to the aisle, and they'll be collected. And we'll speak for a few more minutes, and then we'll move to questions. And I'd just like to add to that question about writing. The, now, Molly and I were both um, noted that when you addressed the journalism students, you said, writing is breathing. Yeah. Uh, so I'd just like to add that that sense of urgency and vitality to Namwali's question about your experience of writing at Cal. Yeah, um, I, I do remember that I always, uh, just a personal, I don't remember where I learned to write. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember first, I actually in high school, a teacher said, um, you'll never be a good writer if you're not a prolific reader. Mm -hmm. And I, that stuck with me. That's the only thing I remember from high school that I liked. But I hated high school. Uh, but, and I always was, and I always, and when I got to school, got here, I always would seek out classes. They actually had classes that had like multiple choice tests. They really did. And, or short essay things. I always avoided those things. I always went to the classes that required essays and stuff, because I figured, what are the odds that a lot of people in the class can write better than me? And I knew they were not very good, it was, it was good for me. Right? That was part of it. And then I found out, oh shit, a lot of these kids can write. You know? <laughs> and so I had to sort of up the game a little bit. So I guess I learned from that, that experience. The other thing that a kind of in a very strange way, I don't know how it relates to journalism, but it does. And this is another incredibly deep idea that I had. I, when I became editor of the Daily Cal, it really impinged on schoolwork, to put it mildly. And so literally, I'm standing in the bookstore one day trying to decide what class to take. And, I'm, and I was some, it was your specialty. I think I was thinking about 19th, I think it was 19th century British novel. That's what the class I wanted to take. And so I looked at the shelf and right of the books. You remember those <laughs> things that are all this thick, right? It's this big. The other thing I had really through, through uh, uh, I don't remember how, what I really come to like was contemporary American poetry. Mm -hmm. So I looked at that, it was like this. <laughs> you know, it was Gary Snyder, Robert Creeley, and Robert Duncan, and that was great. And I thought, okay, this I can do. This, edit a newspaper, no way. <laughs> but actually the study of poetry was really helpful to me. I think just the concise nature of it, mm -hmm. and the, the idea of picking the specific word, you know, that's Lay down these words like rocks, you know, Gary Snyder. Um, you know, and at 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 it just. It, I don't know how I twisted that in my brain because I don't think there's much relationship between poems and news stories, but it helped me understand the importance, I guess, of clarity, which is everything that journalism is about, and it drives me absolutely. And the other thing that helps me with is if you think about. I think almost all writing, and certainly writing for television, writing for the ear, mm. you know, it just has to kind of flow. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to, when, and when someone has learned to be a decent writer, but maybe not a great writer, maybe they're clear, but their stuff just doesn't have any, any rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. It's not as good, you know? And even in, even in when you're writing, when you're listening to an hour or a two hour narrated story, boy, it, it, it's much, more, you might not realize it. It's much more satisfying if that script has a musicality to mm -hmm. it. And I think I learned that probably um, reading all those great, you know, beat poems and other things like that. Mm. Here. The, um, 
you, the, um, just like to come back to the writing for a minute, mm -hmm. that is, you have worked all these years in such an intensely visual medium. Yeah. And you talked a bit before about sometimes the tension between images and words. Um, but I'd like to come back to that writing is breathing phrase. That is, yeah. it seems even more intense than what you just suggested. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the story, I think television is generally for the ear. That's something Don Hewitt preached, not for the eye. The eye is, is fine. And there, are, there, are, there are exceptions when there are you know, just absolutely powerful images. And you know, television is really about, ex really what it tra transmits is experience more than a newspaper can, I think mm. more than the internet can. And you try to, you try to have, you know, the, the script is what gives that experience some meaning if it's well done, I think. And so I think it all starts with the script. And writing on television not only includes uh, the actual words you lay down, but the sound, the interview sound, the, you know, the sound bites, as I call it, that you select. It's like writing dialogue in a way. Of course, this is nonfiction, and you can't twist the words. The guy has said something. You have to use that and write to it and out of it and so forth. But selecting and structuring that sound is as important you know, as the actual words you use. And I just think that what, what I find, uh, and the reason I talk to the journalism students about that is, you know, people can shoot really well. They can, they're, they're, they're really good at persuading people to come on camera. They might be really good at finding research, finding stuff out. But their career is going to hit a ceiling if they're not really good writers, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I, I think in most cases. That, that's the difference between the people who get to work on Dateline and those that don't. Mm -hmm. And we have people who, you know, we work on that just uh, uh, endlessly, I think. Mm -hmm. You um, said earlier in the conversation, you alluded to current events here. Um, Berkeley has been in the news, speaking of the news. The University of California system has been in the news, yeah. as I'm sure you've noticed. And I'm wondering, as a Cal alumnus, what thoughts you have about the California budget crisis, its effects on public education in the state, its effects on Berkeley in particular. Well, next time I see Maria Shriver, I'll give her a hard time. How about that? <laughs> we would appreciate that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I worked with her for many, many. You mentioned a couple of shows. Like she was the anchor of a couple of them. Um, you know, it, 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 the reason that I got reconnected with the school and I'm happy to, to be here uh, is I think that, you know, the budget thing is, is just a true catastrophe uh, for the school. Um, I, I'm not, you know, in my position, I, I don't take any political point of view and want to prescribe what I think publicly ought to be done, but I don't think it's, it's uh, it seems to me um, accurate reporting to, to, to describe it as a catastrophe when you have the kind of budget cuts that you have. And it seems to me the challenge for Berkeley, it's just not good enough for Berkeley to, to, to provide a very good education. It has to, it, it seems to me the role of this campus in particular is to uh, first give access to people like me. I mentioned my father's coming here and saying, well, I'm gonna, my kids can go to school in the university and college system. Well, there ended up being nine of us, all nine did so, you know, in one way or another. Um, but you look now and you see, I, what is it, a third of the kids here um, are Pell Grantees, about the same number, I guess. Uh, uh, are the first ones in their families to go to to go to to go to a university. Uh, a lot of them are the first members of their family to speak English. Well, they don't. They're not coming here just to get the same education that they could get at another fine school in the, in, in uh, California. They want to get the education that she got at Harvard and Yale, or that you know my my staff got at Princeton, Harvard. That's where they all went. Brown. This place needs to provide an elite education that no other public university can provide. That, that's, to me, what it stands for. And I think that's very difficult when the budget is being cut like this. And I'm not sure it's appreciated uh, in the state as much as it should be. Um, you know, someone mentioned uh, today at lunch that there, I think uh, uh, Don did, that there's virtually no, nobody in the legislature that went to Berkeley. And that's, well, why isn't this, this place has to provide the leadership and I'm afraid that the way it's going to be done to, to preserve the school, and I might be wrong, but it seems to me uh, it's going to be tough for the state. 
Um, and the, the trend has always has been, you know, the support has declined. Uh, it's going to have to be uh, the hard way, what John McKee and others are doing. It's going to have to be people like me. It's going to have to be alums. It's going to have to be uh, a mentality that Berkeley uh, provides something that is completely unique, uh, I think, not just in the state, but in the, in the country. And everybody in the community is going to have to rally. I think we're kind of in this on our own in many ways. And we at least ought to have that mentality. And, it, it, and uh, maybe we can, we can preserve some of the qualities of this place. Mm. I appreciate that very much. And uh, we had you sign a release form saying we could use this videotape. <laughs> we may have to use this last answer in many Great. contexts and forums. Uh, although the temptation is to end on that um, note of exhortation, I won't be able to sleep properly tonight unless I ask That's you a few questions, right? who it was who slapped the idea of being an English professor out of you. <laughs> Uh, one of the people was, nobody really, but one of the people was <laughs> Harry Edwards. He was one, very vocal when, when, I don't remember how I, I mean I took a big class from him, the class was terrible, but uh, <laughs> it was like a big class and I remember how everybody came, it was a required class and everybody came pouring in and there were three times as many people as, as uh, there were seats and he said okay. Everybody who's got a seat is in. Everybody who's standing is out. So of course, people went crazy. It's like, it's, I'm a senior. I got to have this class. I came from all the way across campus. Things you know. haven't changed so yeah. much. And so he said, OK, anybody who can beat up somebody in a seat gets it. <laughs> and if not, and he said, hey, that's life. But I got to spend some time with him in some other smaller contexts. And he was very vocal about, I mean, he kind of crystallized the conversation, I think, that we were all having about what should we do? Should we go to law school? Should we go to be? And it was a, there was a guy, it was a professor here, certainly wouldn't remember me, but I never remember his name. He was a good writer, Ron Lowenson. Mm -hmm. And he was very much urging me to, you know, pursue uh, English literature and all that stuff. And I was really sort of sentimentally at least leaning that way. But um, as I say, it was sort of like, well, I'll, you know, try this news thing for a while, mm -hmm. see how that goes. So. You mentioned before that uh, you would plan to come back to Berkeley. I just want yeah. to let you know as chair of the English department, anytime. OK. <laughs> I still, I still um, might. The way the journalism world is going, I'm, you know, <laughs> I may have plenty of time on my hands. We're happy to reserve a slot in our uh, admissions class. Thank you. Um, we'll turn to questions now. And the first question actually provides a kind of segue from what you were just returning to at the end now, which you also mentioned at the beginning, which is the sense that you were, when you were at Berkeley in the late 60s and the early 70s, um, it was important to be um, socially engaged mm -hmm. and to take uh, the critical and the political investments, as you put it, to conservative institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is, um, you mentioned that you joined the news media to be, in quotation marks, subversive. Um, do you feel like uh, you have accomplished this? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Next I, question. I, you know, <laughs> I think that the news business has changed quite a bit uh, in some good ways. I don't think that journalism practiced. A lot of people got into journalism after 72, after, uh, um, uh, you know, Watergate and, the, and, the, and Pentagon Papers and all kinds of things like that. I, I think the newsroom has changed, newsrooms have changed very much uh, the positive. I mean, when I, even when I was hanging out in the, in the early 70s as a summer relief writer and thing, they were all white male. It, was all, it still had that sort of macho feel you know, from the front page. And there were a hazing of young people. And the women who survived tended to be kind of very, very sort of smart ass, kind of the cliched, you know, tough old bird kind of women. The women were not particularly welcome. Certainly, there was nobody of color, and um, yeah, a lot of people drinking. All those cliches were true. I mean, I, I worked with a guy who became really a mentor to me. This is a true story. Every morning for breakfast, this guy was a great reporter, international reporter, and grizzled old veteran guy. Every morning for breakfast, he had two cups of coffee, two glasses of orange juice, 
two big fat Danish, two cigarettes, and two martinis. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And he gave a hard time to everybody. I, I was able to survive that as were some of the young women that I was working with, they were my age at the time. That's all sort of gone now. I mean, the language of the newsrooms is different. The behavior is different. The macho stuff is, most people who enter the newsroom are women now. Um, there are a lot more uh, people of color in newsrooms, though not nearly enough. Uh, but that we, ha that we did change. And it's not, uh, it wasn't resented, but certainly by, by my generation. It was, um, it was um, fostered by, by my gener generation. And, and, and uh, you know, I have a simple hiring policy now. I basically hire women. They're the, best, they're the best employees by far. In fact, if you can find women with like two little kids, that's it. They're the best organized, they're the smartest, they're the most talented, they don't gossip, they don't know office politics. I'm serious about this. They are the best. And you know, they, women are the best in everything and they're the best employees too. <laughs> there you go. Trust me, it works. Um, in answer to the first question about taking um, critical and political investments um, into the boardroom, you talked um, about changes in the way, uh, in, in who was in those rooms mm. and how decisions are made in those rooms, mm -hmm. not just the boardroom, but the newsroom. Newsroom, yeah. The, the, newsroom. Uh, the second- The newsroom way more than the boardroom. Newsroom way more than the boardroom. Yeah. The second question has to do with the content or delivery of news, and it is, um, why do you think network news did such a bad job of contesting the Bush administration and their justification for the invasion of Iraq? Yeah, well there's a lot of debate about that. I think if my boss were here, he would say we didn't do such a bad job. Um, you know, it wasn't just, in my estimation, it was not just uh, Judith Miller at the New York Times. Uh, we, I remember those days, and I wasn't the primary reporter on that stuff, we couldn't find anybody who didn't think there was WMD. Uh, now, there were reporters who got it right, particularly, most famously, two guys who worked for Knight Ritter and later for McClatchy. Um, we hired as consultants, I remember, the last two guys who were the UN inspectors. They, you know, and they came and made presentations and had stuff like this, and it was mind-numbing. One of them, his name I can't remember, the Australian guy, uh, invented the phrase or popularized the phrase WMD. The other guy was the guy Bush hired. He had to leave NBC as a consultant because the Bush administration sent him to Iraq after the initial invasion to find the WMD. And he came back fairly famously in front of Congress and said, I was wrong, there isn't any. There were a lot, there was Bill Clinton, if you remember, and the Clinton administration, the members of the Clinton administration said there's WMD. Everybody, everybody, that was widely believed. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that, that the news media couldn't have done a better job, but I think it's oversimplified in, in the telling. Uh, I think it's a very good lesson for, you know, um, for all journalists. I mean, it's the simplest thing is don't, don't make any assumptions. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was wild flag waving as some people have, have claimed. Uh, you know, and I, and I don't think whether there was WMD or not, sh was, was going to war the right thing to do, even if there was. You know, that, that, that question has been sort of, I think, obscured by this discussion about whether it was the news media's fault, you know. Um, you know, I think it's more complex than that. The next question also has to do with the content of the news and a recent story that consumed the airwaves. Um, how do you feel about stories like the recent Balloon Boy scandal um, that flooded the airwaves? Is there merit in stories like these? Um, could the time dedicated to these national sensations be better used? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of things there. One is uh, um, there's an assumption that if people weren't watching Balloon Boy, they'd be watching Darfur, as I said earlier. And that, there's no evidence of that. Absolutely none. People can watch. There's tons of docu documentaries went off the air largely because nobody watched them. That's, that's why. Edward R. Murrow, most of his uh, famous documentaries appeared on Sunday afternoon. You know, I mean, there's, there's you know, people, you know, it's like I get home, do I want to watch Frontline or a basketball game? Kind of depends on, 
how, how the day has gone. I think that's, that's perfect human, human nature. There's plenty of opportunity to, 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 wa to watch other things. I, you know, people sort of get, I mean, nobody likes to say this, just people sort of get what they pay for. I mean, I don't understand. In my house, we have thousands of channels, it seems like. The TV's off a lot, you know? I mean, we do other things. I, you know, I don't think, no, people don't get this stuff forced down their throats. They, they watch what they're interested in. Um, the Balloon Boy was, a, that's another thing that uh, escapes me. People watch, they say it was on cable for hours. And I said, well, why were you watching for hours? Right. <laughs> you know, and got, got kind of repetitive. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but the way cable works is there's, you know, there's a million people or less watching at any given moment. But it's, it's designed like the headlines at the top of the radio, knowing that that audience is turning over constantly. <laughs> so if you're one of the people that are just sitting there like a zombie in front of the television, I don't know, I just don't have all that much sympathy for you, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and that's really where you see those volumes of stuff. You see it uh, on cable. You don't see that on the network, on the network news particularly. I remember um, the year that uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. died, which got heavily covered. Uh, a far more dramatic story than Balloon Boy, although I thought the Balloon Boy story was pretty interesting. Uh, I mean, what was that father thinking? You know, and th that story is a, as much maybe about reality TV and the mm. desire to be, uh, you know, it's like if people don't, aren't on TV, their life doesn't exist. I don't understand that. Um, the year John F. Kennedy died, Kosovo was like the big serious story. And at the end of the year, they do these studies where they count up the number of minutes spent by the news on various projects. They're very, very specious surveys because what is a serious thing and what is not and all this. But that year, you know, everybody said, well, everybody overcovered John, poor John Kennedy. Well, there were many, many, many more hours devoted to Kosovo. Yet that story never really resonated with the American public. And we tore our hair out about that. And mm -hmm. we spent a lot of money and a lot of time and we felt at the end of the day we had failed to make the connection, you know, for for the audience. Uh, between sort of their lives and, and you know, it's, it's easy for audiences to connect to something that's relevant to them right away, like the weather, you know? But, but what about stories? What about, you know, the future, uh, you know, of humanity? Those that, what about nuclear proliferation? Those stories are big, you know, and they're very hard to see how that intersects with your daily life. And that's part of our job, to try to make that intersection. But it's difficult at times. Balloon Boy is, People is a highly re relatable story because it's a, it's a, about a family and this desire for publicity and all these other things and this exploitation of a child apparently and all this other stuff that's kind of crazy <laughs> and 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 uh, you know it came and went actually kind of floated away. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, take one uh, final question um, and this is about your role as a producer. Um, across your career at CBS, at Fox, at mm -hmm. NBC. Mm -hmm. At one point, I didn't work at the Fox News Channel. That, that, that didn't <laughs> exist. At that. It was the Fox Television Network. That is so recorded. Thank you. <laughs> it's an important <laughs> thing to record. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of Berkeley graduates at the Fox News Channel. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just guessing. Uh, did you ever have a story you really cared about um, um, when you were working on the Daily Cal in college or in your career as a producer um, that, that uh, couldn't be run for whatever reason? Um, if so, how did you deal with that experience? Um, I'm, I'm sure there were. Uh, um, I mean, I, everyone has their own sort of personal interests that would not run because it wouldn't be of interest to enough people. Um, uh, if I was going to write a story about, uh, oh, I just mentioned, you know, what's Gary Snyder, uh, I don't think anybody would really be interested in that story, <laughs> except me, so I'm, I wouldn't be able to do that one. Um, on the other hand... How do you figure it, that out? How do you know when something's going to only appeal well, to you? Well, you don't always, yeah. but I know about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know when it's not going to appeal. You know, I mean, that's kind of what I'm paid to do, <laughs> Right. Uh, is figure those things out. and I'm. I'm constantly wrong, but uh, 
uh, I'm sort of right enough that mm -hmm. I keep keep my so job. It's, it's an instinct again. Like yeah, but also you know like like you know how many books of poems are, are bought right. in the country? You right. know, I mean, you just you just know. Um, uh, it doesn't get to the point where you do a story and it doesn't run. I mean, the the, the process is not like that. You whether you're in a, in a newspaper or or a television, you suggest a story. You know, you're told yes or no. Maybe it's a tentative yes. You don't go out and spend money, hire crews, and work on a story, and then they somebody says, "Yeah, I didn't like that. Let's not do that." You know, there may be reasons like you, it's poorly reported, and it, and it can't get on the air. Uh, it's it somehow becomes out of date. Uh, there are things like that that keep stories off the air. But it, it probably, if it's a marginal story, particularly, let's say it's something that doesn't sound, you know, like Balloon Boy. You're not sure whether they're gonna. You know, well, that's discussed in advance, and you get a chance to make your case for a story. I mean, I'm not in, I haven't been in that position in a long time because it's kind of, so to speak, my show, so I can kind of approve the stories, and I, my in parentheses, because it's my network show. Um, and if I just put on stuff that I was interested in all the time and, and didn't have any thought for what my audience would really be interested in, the show wouldn't last. You mentioned that you m might want to do a show on Gary Snyder. But if you could be guaranteed an audience of tens of millions, um, what kind of story would you like to do that you haven't been able to do? Well, I don't. There's no such. There's that. That's. I that, understand. That, that question <laughs> that makes no sense. Well, I think it's, it's, Very it's nice I mean, to not answer to, the question <laughs> that makes no sense. Maybe, maybe another you know. a different way of putting it would be: what's a, what's a story that you didn't think would have mass appeal, but actually ended up being really successful? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say last year, just it, it didn't. You know what? You know what we did last year? We did a story on the 40th, and this is a silly story. Then I'll tell. You. We did a, for, a story on the 40th anniversary of Woodstock, mm -hmm. and we thought, well, who, you know, jeez. I mean, we cared, right? <laughs> but and we thought, well, we get away with it. And, and the reason I could do it was I, the company was was had a movie about the 40th anniversary yeah, of yeah, Woodstock. Yeah. So I said to myself, you know, well, that's all right. I mean, that, that, you know, if it, I'll put it on a Sunday right around the anniversary. And if it doesn't do great, that's, it's okay. Well, it did great. So There's I was surprised by that. Too, right? The movie too, right? The movie didn't movie. do great. Okay, yeah. Let's okay. not bring that okay. up. <laughs> so I like the people who, who did it. Uh, but um, the week, two weeks before that, I think we had done a story about Iran. We went to Iran. Spent some time inside Iran, trying to get a little broader picture of it. The timing, we, we worked for months to get in, and you have to go through a process and get visas. You can't just wander into Iran, right, with a camera crew. Um, and we have uh, an Iranian uh, reporter who lives there and stuff, but you know his life is, is, is uh, um, pretty tough at times. Anyway, we finally got in. We finally got permission and you know all that as it turned out, a week before the election. So we put this hour on the Sunday. The election was the next Friday, I think it was, or something. And we got a really, really good, strong response to the story. And it was well done, and Curry did it. And it had a lot of really interesting, not just the interviews with the presidential candidates, but also um, stuff about the hospitals. It actually focused on some women, a women film, film director, a woman surgeon. Uh, and, and a few other people, and had a lot of young people in it, and it, it was really uh, revealing. It was a good, good piece of work, and I thought, well, I don't care really. I mean, I got I caught on videotape saying I don't care if I have an audience. We, we were doing the story regardless, because mm -hmm. um, we felt like that was an important story, and it got a really, really excellent audience, so we were extremely happy. And we've done stories that we thought we were very, very proud of and didn't get audiences either, that, that it were you know, above or below average, but you know, it has to it has to work out over time. I think that's a good place to end. I remind you all that there's a reception down the hall. I'm sure David Corvo would be happy to talk further and answer further questions. Uh, for now, I hope you'll join me in thanking David for coming, spending time with us. Thank you.